Good afternoon, everybody. This is Alexis with Recruiting Daily, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm on the line with my colleague, Ryan Leary. The two of us will be your behind the scenes Recruiting Daily voices today for the webinar. As you can see, we're going to be talking sourcing tools. Oh, I guess someone unmuted me, but now I'm not. Great. <laughs> uh, here's the plan for today. As always, you um, are in listen-only mode. We, uh, you can't, we can't hear you, but you can hear us. I'm sorry, you're still giggling. Somebody tried to turn me off. <laughs> Make sure that you take notes along the way. Ask questions. Raise your hand. Follow along online. Hashtag our daily. Um, please engage. Try it out. We don't bite. We can't bite you. We're doing this online. So please join us and have a lot of fun. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand everything over to today's expert and presenter, and he's going to be taking you through the rest of today's webinar. So if you just give me one second, I'll hand it over, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Tigran, I'm handing it over to you. And you should be all set to start showing your screen and your expertise. Awesome. <clears throat> well, thanks a lot for that intro, Alexis. Uh, hi, everyone. Excited to be here today talking to you all. Uh, right after I make my screen to show you everything. There we go. OK, so hey, everyone. My name is Tigran. Uh, I'm the co-founder CEO of Code Fights, which is a platform that helps recruiters like you all find qualified engineers faster, uh, which basically means that we work with hundreds of recruiters to help them find more qualified engineers while actually also helping them do recruiting better and seeing a lot of data around work, work, what works, what doesn't. So today I'm going to share some of those learnings as well as show you some hacks around how can you make your recruiting life more productive and get more out of the time you spend doing recruiting and sourcing. So my background is actually fairly technical. I went to MIT. I double majored in computer science and math, as well as got a degree in economics. I worked at Google and Oracle before starting Code Fights. And you can see my LinkedIn right there. Uh, if you'd like to connect, I would love to have you in my network. So feel free to send the requests. So here's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, essentially, it's the, the presentation consists of four main parts. We'll start with a very practical hack, which is around how do you find emails? <clears throat> we all know, <clears throat> excuse me, we all know that LinkedIn email is fine, but the response rates tend to be very low because, you know, not, not everybody's sitting out there checking their LinkedIn all day long. So if you can have somebody's email, that's always a more reliable way to reach out to them and get a response back. So we'll talk through a hack around how you can find the emails. Uh, then we'll move on to talk about how do you write great templates and what templates work, which ones don't, based on the data we've collected. Uh, and then, of course, following up is an underappreciated art. So we'll touch on that. And finally, we'll close by talking about branding, which, again, is very crucial, kind of sourcing and recruiting. A lot of people just approach it as a, you know, one angle. But it's a holistic approach that gets you to success. So. Today, we'll touch on all of these four parts. And feel free to ask questions. I'd love to make this interactive. So if anybody has any questions, you should be able to put it in the, some sort of a question field on your end. And then Ryan or Alexis will interrupt me and ask. So let's make it fun and interactive if you have any questions. With that said, let's get going. So let's start with finding those emails. So here's an interesting hack. Some of you might already know this technique. Uh, even if you do, uh, I will still show you ways to make it even better. If you don't, this would come as a nice surprise to you all, because uh, when I saw it first time, I was like, that's interesting. So what's the key idea? The key idea is that most people have pretty standard emails. So it's either your first name or your last name, or first and last name, or first initial and last name, or some sort of a reasonable combination. Which means that 
with some work, you can generate pretty much all possible combinations of what could be someone's email. And then if you found a way to filter out the ones that are obviously a no-go, uh, and you had a way to check if any of those emails are actually correct, which turns out you can through a Chrome extension, uh, it will get you basically with a little bit of work an email of everybody, anybody you want out there. So here is how it works in greater detail. So starting with generating email combinations. Uh, the guy who came up with this idea of doing this did not actually make this tool. Somebody else built this tool on top of that idea. It's called an email permutator. Uh, I believe you're going to have access to the slides, but if you want to find it now and try it out, if you just Google email permutator, it should bring up this as your number one result uh, with that cute bird sitting on the top. So what the email permutator lets you do is input someone's first name, someone's last name, a middle name or a nickname if you know any, and a domain that you want to use, such as Gmail or their company, which are the two most common domains that their email will be at. And then as soon as you click permutate, it will essentially generate for you all possible combination of this person's email. So you can see right here, I've basically shown you that after I inputted my first name, my last name, and clicked permutate, it generated 34 possible emails for me. And guess what? That third one is actually correct. That's my personal Gmail account. Now, what would you next? Who would you next, right? This is still way too many emails. So next, you want to get rid of the emails that are definitely incorrect. You can do that in two ways. One is using hunter.io, which basically tracks everybody's email out there and tries to find the most plausible pattern. This works especially well with company emails. So if you go to hunter and input codefights.com, which I've just done this screenshot and click search, look what it does, right? It finds email addresses out there that are you know, correct. And it also identifies the most common pattern. So in this case, you can see that hunter.io says, most likely codefights emails are first name at codefights.com, which is also correct. So in this case, you would probably get rid of most of the permutations that were generated and just stay with first name at code fights or first and last name at code fights, which seems to be also a plausible combination. Another trick you can do to get rid of emails that are definitely incorrect is this site called mailtester.com. Uh, how this works is a little bit more complex, but I'll explain to you in just a few words, right? What, what this does is, it, is actually when you input an email address and click check address, it would actually send what engineers call a ping to that email uh, to see it actually doesn't send any emails. It just sends a, like an invisible signal. And if that signal comes back, that's a sign that that's an existing email. That's somebody's email. If it doesn't come back, it will give you this red error that says email address does not exist on the server. So this is another great way to check whether something is a valid email and cut down your possible permutations to a few, which then you would feed to LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So here is the culmination of this, right? This used to be called Reportive. For some of you that have used this before and are like, is this a new thing? They've recently rebranded this from Reportive to LinkedIn Sales Navigator. This used to be a startup that got acquired by LinkedIn. And essentially, it's a Chrome extension that you install uh, on your Chrome browser. And what that does is it adds this sidebar, you can see here. Uh, and what the sidebar is, is that whenever inside your Gmail or your company email, assuming you use Google Apps, when you hover over an email address, it will look up their LinkedIn profile using that email address if it exists. And then it will pop it up right here on the right side. Now. Somebody, one day, I'm not going to claim inventing this technique, came up with the genius idea. Well, if it lets you do an email lookup for LinkedIn addresses, you could do a reverse lookup to find the email. Uh, so we've talked about how you generate the permutations, how you cut it down to a few that seem plausible. And then assuming you've got the extension installed, you click to create a new message. You enter all of the possible combinations that you're left with in your to section 
right? This is what I have done here. This is the 34 that I copied. I actually didn't cut it down to a few that I believe are plausible. And then only after like three hovers, right? I hovered over the first one, didn't work. Second one didn't work. When I hovered on the third one, which I told you is my correct email, it instantly brought up my LinkedIn, which basically the point is not finding my LinkedIn. The point, point is verifying that that is my correct address. And it's as simple as that. I'm assuming this was a thorough enough explanation. If anybody had questions, probably Ryan would have asked. So I'm going to move on to topic number two. Topic number two is writing great templates. As I said, people do not appreciate how important this is and how important follow-ups are. So the next two sections where we talk about templates and emails and follow-ups you'll see why it's so important. So templates. Uh, well, we have analyzed a lot of reach outs from recruiters to candidates, right? As I told you, it's kind of a marketplace where recruiters would reach out to candidates and get responses back. So we get a lot of visibility into what type of messages work, what type of messages don't work. And here's what the analysis says. The analysis says that you know, on the personalization level, which means do you send a vanilla template? Do you add some personalization, like basic stuff, like, hey, I see you do cool stuff at company X, or do you go really deep and do like highly personalized email or a message where you talk about some of their interests, why that's relevant, and like their hobbies, you try to find a way to connect with them, all of that, right? Like deeply personalized messages. So what data from thousands and thousands of messages says is that you should either personalize or you should not. Like doing a little bit of personalization gives you basically nothing. Uh, essentially what this graph is showing you is that if you don't personalize, you get about 50-50 except decline. If you do a little bit of personalization, you still get the same thing. So you just wasted your time doing a little bit of personalization. And of course, if you do a lot of personalization, you get significantly better results in terms of your accept rates. However, this is also a significant investment of your time, right? So like the recommendation here is that you should either do this or you should do this. Uh, if you're doing more very targeted and very specific role where there's only a few people that you find every day, you should probably spend more time and go for this approach to get higher response rates. Whereas if, for example, you're recruiting for a entry level new grad role, then you're better off going for this one because you can shoot for volume and still get the same results as if you had spent five minutes on each one personalizing it. Hey, Tigran, we, we do have a question that has come in around personalization. Go for and, it. Uh, yep. Yeah, so they're looking to see if you have any, and they believe you do in the upcoming slides, examples of what you would consider. Uh, to be the best level of or templates for personalization? Um, and then which do you recommend? Do you go impersonal or personal? Yep. So I guess we've covered the last part of that question just now regarding you go personalized if it's low volume, in meaning it's a highly specialized role. You go impersonal if it's a volume game, right? If it's all about a just sending enough messages so you get a few responses. Now, regarding the first part of that question, recommendations, that's exactly the next slides. So I've got two examples for you, both for a great vanilla template as well as a highly personalized one. And I'll cover the core building parts of each one. So let's start with a good vanilla template. Uh, here's what it consists of, right? It usually should have three main parts. This is what normally works well. Uh, it should start with who you are, why are you reaching out, because most of the time, I mean, if you're doing this on Codefice, people obviously have some sort of context, but it's still helpful to say, like, here's where I found you, here's why I'm reaching out, right? So just basing it true. Now, the second part, which a lot of recruiters sell themselves short on, is just pitching your company, right? A lot of recruiters are, you know, have very high EQ, and they're worried about, uh, like sounding like a show off and just pitching their company too aggressively, but you should not. I mean, honestly, this is the first time a candidate is hearing about you. 
So you want to go all out and pitch it as if you know your founder is pitching it to a VC. Uh, you obviously want to keep it short, but you know say all the great things that uh, you know about your company. If your mission is amazing, mention that. If you've got awesome customers, mention that. If you're one of the fastest growing companies, mention that. I mean, find things that are incredibly exciting about your company and put it into a single paragraph and think of it as an elevator pitch for the company. And a third point in a vanilla template would be more about like what is it like working there, right? Because there's one thing to say we're a great business. There is another thing to say people actually enjoy working here. So you don't want to neglect that second part, especially if you're going to send a vanilla template and you're probably not going to connect with this person on a more personal level if they don't respond back to you. You want to make sure uh, to include both the culture piece as well as any social validation you've got. Right. So like this third point, uh, you would have something like if you've been featured, something like a glass door, best place to work, or if you've got great reviews, or if Business Insider or some other publication has featured you, this is where you want to go for, it's a great place to work, people love it, and here is what all these publications are saying about us. Now, on to a more personalized version. When you're going for a deeply personalized version, uh, first of all, you start with the personalization, right? So like, it has to start with, I have done my research, I know exactly who you are, and this is, here is why this is such an amazing fit for you, and here's why I really want to talk to you as a one human being to another human being. Uh, in this example that I've quickly put together here, I was imagining if I'm reaching out to someone and if they liked, I saw on their resume they like poker, they maybe went to MIT, I would go all in and talk to them about like, hey, love your background, I'm also from there, you know, so you play poker, I do too, we should do it. And it really shows that you're not just doing click, click, template, click, click, template, like you cared, you looked. And the deeper you go, the better insights you can put into that first paragraph, but you still wanna keep it under something like four to five lines. If you go way over that, that's people don't like reading, as you all know. Now, Going deeply personalized doesn't mean you shouldn't pitch the company. After all, you're reaching out to get them excited about a job at the company, so you still have to have the pitch in there. But with personalization and the pitch, this template can get too long, which you obviously don't want. So our recommendation is that don't go too deep into the culture and uh, kind of the external link side to keep it short. Uh, you kind of already, by doing so much research about them and trying to connect them with them on a personal level, showed that, that you're one example of a great person who works there. So that kind of covers a little bit the culture piece. But you definitely want to end with some sort of a suggestion to meet or have a call, even if they're not interested. See, now you've invested a lot of your personal time learning about them. So it's okay to offer an option and say, if you're not in, even if you're not interested right now, maybe you're onto an exciting project, maybe it's not the right time, you still want to make the connection. Because as I said, these highly personalized emails are mostly for uh, kind of low volume and highly targeted roles, where the only way to recruit is really to build long-term partnerships and play the long-term game where if they're not ready now, they might be ready 12 months from now. So you want to connect and build a report and reduce the pressure around, hey, you have to come join us like tomorrow. Cool. I guess moving on to following up. Uh, I know I have done this myself and so many people do forget to follow up, but I'm gonna try to convince you in this section that it's more important to follow up than to reach out to you and your person. Uh, here is why. <clears throat> So there is this company called Outreach.io. These guys are full on sales, right? So like they help salespeople generate business uh, and generate prospects, which is pretty much uh, same language as in recruiting because recruiting and sales are actually really similar. In one case, you're trying to find a candidate to you know, sell them on a job. In the other case, people are trying to find businesses to sell them on a, some sort of product or software. 
And the flows are pretty similar too. Like you reach out, then you send a follow-up, then you try to send another follow-up until you kind of find them. Now, these guys have done research and found a kind of a mind-blowing fact, right? And the fact is that your second and third and fourth follow-ups have a higher chance of getting you a response back than your first one does. So like a first reach out in a typical campaign would have something like a 12% response rate. When you send a, a second touch, like a second follow-up, essentially the response rate from the, the second batch of emails sent is more like 17%. And it doesn't go down that much after a third and a fourth. And even at the fifth reach out, you're still kind of training about the same response rate as from your first one. So what this is essentially saying that like if you do five follow-ups, you increase your chances of getting a response back by more than 5x. And it's only after the fifth one where the sixth and the seventh have like significantly result, you know, reduced results. People still do them sometimes, but uh, unless you have some sort of an automation around it that helps you do this, the sixth and the seventh one might not be your best friend. And here's what this means. Like what this means is that, let's do a back of the envelope map here, math here. So if you have 100 candidates that you've reached out to, and if your initial response rate is something like 10% to keep it around, and your success rate from a candidate who responds to a candidate who gets hired is about 10%, which doesn't seem, probably that's most likely even higher than what most people see, but Again, keeping the math around here, right? So out of 100 total, you get about 10 responses, about one out of those 10 gets uh, higher, and you end up with 100 reach outs and one higher. This assumes no follow-ups, which as I said, a lot of recruiters do, and I've done it myself because, I mean, it's not that easy, right, to keep track of who you should follow up with, how and when. Uh, now, what happens if you send at least three follow-ups? Well, as I said, every follow-up basically has, I mean, the first two have an increased chance, but even if we assume that they have an equal chance of getting your response back, you get this insane multiple. So from 100 reach-outs and three follow-ups, you actually increase your likelihood of getting a response back by 3x, which means out of 100 total reach-outs, keeping everything else the same, you were more likely to end up with three hires, which is a great return. Because at the end of the day, even if you're hiring for a entry level role, your supply is still limited. So if you just keep sending single reach outs and not following up on them, eventually you're gonna run out. Now, when it comes to like making sure you do remember to follow up, I guess, most of you should be using applicant tracking systems. So one approach that I've seen work successfully is snoozing. Essentially, if your plan is to follow up on day three, follow up on day uh, eight, and then follow up on day 10, every time you send a message, you can snooze that candidate for a few days. So like if I just reached out, I can snooze them for three days. When they get unsnoozed, I will get a notification, and then I'll go follow up, and then snooze them again for however many days I plan to follow up next. That way it will send you a reminder. If you don't use an applicant tracking system or if it doesn't have a snoozing function, you can always use any to-do list to do, to, do, to do this basically, right? You use Wonderlist or Asana, whichever to-do list you prefer. Whichever candidates you've got in play, you can always set a task for yourself with a due date to do your follow-up. That way you don't have to keep this all in your head. It will just, the system will keep prompting you to do it. Now, here is a crucial piece, right? Because I'm sure by now you're thinking, aren't people getting annoyed by all of these follow-ups? Well, guess what? They don't. A data piece that I didn't include from that outreach.io research is that if you give people a chance to opt out, the rate at which they opt out from your first reach out and second reach out is pretty much the same as from your third reach out and fourth reach out and fifth reach out. So people don't get more annoyed from your subsequent reach outs. They're basically at the same level of happiness as from your first one. Now, the way you make this more interesting and get it, you know, first of all, higher response rates, and second of all, be less kind of like make it all about you, right? It's really tempting to just make your follow up as, hey, it's me again, you didn't respond to me. Hey, it's me again, you didn't respond again. That's too demanding. Here is a different way. 
add value every time you follow up, right? Every time you send them another message asking, just bubbling this back up, send something new, right? Send a company video, send them some recent press, send them a cool project that you guys are working on, some recent win, maybe something about your culture, maybe a photo that you guys just took. Uh, and most importantly, this is like taken from sales one-on-one that, again, a lot of recruiters don't do, is always end with a closing question. What a closing question is, is that people are not going to go back to your first email and read what, what you wanted from them, right? They need a quick call to action question from you that they can say almost like a yes or a no to, right? So like always ending with something that says, are you available for a quick call tomorrow or Wednesday? I'm pretty open Friday afternoon. Any chance you have 10 minutes to discuss on the phone? This is called a closing question. By giving this in here, first, you create an urge in the candidate that it's impolite to not answer a direct question. If all you said is just sent this, there is no question. They're like, OK, thanks. Nice video. If you actually include a closing question, you arise this urge in them to write back to you. And guess what? Now you've made it easy for them. I can literally, to this question, I can literally say, yes, I can talk tomorrow at TPM. To this question, I can say, yes, Friday afternoon sounds good. That's like four or five words. Whereas without this, kind of making it hard for me. Now I have to say, hey, cool video. Appreciate your initial reach out. What, what would you like to do next? Would a call make sense? It's more work. So you ideally want to make it as easy for them as possible, which would lead to more responses in your inbox. Tigran, we have two questions that that I came in on this on this uh, go for it. Great time. Okay, so first question is, what do you recommend to use for scheduling calls when sending volumes of candidates? What would I recommend for scheduling calls when sending volumes of candidates? Uh, I would recommend Calendly, which is what I use personally. There is a ton of different options. I've seen people use Mixmax, which I have not used, but Mixmax is a similar solution. Uh, the one that I use and it works pretty well is called Calendly. Uh, what Calendly lets you do is to create different types of meetings, like a 30-minute meeting or an hour meeting, and you just include a link where people can go in and book. Now, you have to try this, right? Some people find it too aggressive to send a link right away, like in your initial reach out to say, here's a link, go schedule if you're interested. That almost sounds like you're avoiding the work. If you're going for volume, though, it might be the best choice. Okay. What I found most helpful is when they respond back to you and say, yes, I'm interested, then you say, to make scheduling easier, here is a link. Would you mind picking a time and confirming in there? OK, so we have a follow-up to that question. Um, and I don't know how deep you go here, if you, if you have any, any recommendations, but what are your yeah. thoughts on scheduling bots over a calendar link? So rather than, say, a Calendly link, something like you know, My Alley or something like that, um, where yeah. they handle the entire scheduling process? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I could be biased here, but I've seen people use the bots. I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, natural language processing, which is what those bots use, is still an emerging tech, right? Like, basically what those bots normally do is you say like, hey, something, something, please schedule a meeting for something, something else. Now, those bots usually work well if they're like, you get the wording exactly right. As soon as you diverge from the natural wording, uh, the bots break. So in my experience, something like Calendly or Mixmax is a, significantly more reliable and less likely to break. The bots are cool, but could lead to unnecessary breakage. OK, and we have one more question uh, for, for this section here. How do you determine the type of content that you send to candidates? Is it the same for all candidates, or do you personalize based on the send? That's a great question. Uh, I think. I mean, if you can personalize, sure, but it's still, again, more demanding on you. I mean, in general, great content is not just sitting there all the time. So like to have great content, you, your marketing team or you have to spend quite a bit of time. So I'm assuming you won't have too much to 
have a choice. But if you have a choice and you feel like something would be more appealing to this person than uh, another piece of content, sure, go for that. I mean, if you have gone person, full on personalized, if you keep it that way, even better. But given that the follow-ups emails are so short, I think uh, anything that just gives them an additional reason to respond back to you, uh, usually pitching your company, is great for them. Right, and, and some of these, uh, and I'll add to that as I, so just so everybody knows, we put a poll up on the screen. Um, so go ahead and answer that poll as we're answering these questions here um, so we can get an idea of who we have on the call, what type of openings. Do you most often recruit for? Just go ahead and answer that, and then we'll we'll kind of spit back those results in a bit. And Tigran, and I'll share those with you. Uh, so some of the a lot of the recruited recruitment marketing systems that are out there today, the quasi ATS or recruitment marketing systems, uh, will have the ability to essentially treat it as a sales CRM mm -hmm. and allow you to. This, is, this goes to the question about around content and allow you to essentially have a. a, a you know, a, 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 a build up or a folder of specific content to infuse at any time, whether it's automated through marketing automation or just a pick and grab. And so uh, a lot of recruiting organizations that we see today for companies that we work with, we're seeing a lot of companies that have a stable of, of content. They may have, for example, 10 pieces of content that the recruiters can choose from. And if they're talking to a candidate at a specific level, you know, call it stage one, they'll have two or three pieces of content they can select from. If they're in stage five or six, they'll have another two or three pre-approved pieces of content they can select from uh, right from their system. So, um, you know, getting they're getting personal, but they're pre-approved personal pieces of content that are tested and known to work uh, for that particular organization. So hopefully that kind of helps add some color there. So I'm going to go in and close the poll out. Um, so we have, wow, a, <laughs> so we've got, uh, I'm not going to share the, the results. I'm just going to speak them out so it doesn't close your screen off, Tigran. Okay. So we've got 62% uh, of the people on the call today recruit for technical openings. Great. Then we have 28% other. And then three, one, and six percent for administrative, financial, and healthcare. Um, so I don't know what the, what the other are, you know, what the other openings are, but sixty-two percent technical openings. So that falls um, kind of right into these tactics and strategies that you're sharing. Right, and I guess a lot of the stuff we've shared today is applicable regardless of the role. But yeah. I'm assuming, given the my the name of my company, <laughs> people have self self selected more into the technical recruiting side. Uh, that's great. So let's move on to. There were no other questions, right? Right now. No, we are good to go. Good. Okay. So let's move on to the last section. Uh, this would be fairly quick, but I wanted to emphasize this mainly because. Uh, this is a buyer's market. What that means is that uh, it's, you know, people look you up and they do their own research. It's great when you surface up content for them in your templates and your follow-ups, but almost everybody is going to start searching about you and there's gonna, they're going to go to the sites they know and try to find things about you before they get back to you. Uh, now, given that, to ensure, you know, after you found the emails, after you wrote great templates, after you've got your follow-ups going, you still want to make sure that you are presented in the best light out there so that when people start looking you up, they will find and see how awesome you are. If you don't pay attention to it, organically it ends up being not so great. So I've picked kind of like a case study here. I've picked Uber. I know they've had a lot of ups and downs recently, but it's an interesting example. So uh, let's go through through and see what Uber does when it comes to like brand awareness, especially around technical recruiting, right? So like, where do people go when they want to learn more about your company? Well, first, they would probably be interested in knowing how. Uh, what do your employees say about you, right? So like, how do they rate your CEO? Is there good reviews or not? And I'm sure all of you know about Glassdoor. So like Glassdoor, uh, you want to be monitoring those reviews. You want to be making sure uh, there is nothing bad happening. If there is, there's always ways to sort of 
try to mitigate that or at least take it as feedback so you can improve and over time get better ratings. Uh, now, another thing that Uber does is, of course, they're on this site called The Muse, which is great for showcasing that you've got great uh, people and a great office, right? So what The Muse does, uh, it's fairly expensive, but they basically come in and they take very professional photos of your team, of your office, and they kind of create a page for you. This is a screenshot of Uber's page on The Muse, which kind of, again, gives the vibe of what is it like working there and what are the people like. They usually do videos of the people working there as well. And then finally, especially for the technical crowd, uh, for the technical recruiters in you, like there's honestly one of the most important things that as an engineer I care about is am I going to be working on great technical challenges, right? And even though Uber these days is known as a pretty big tech company, a few years ago they were more like a uh, perceived a little bit as a taxi company, right? Which is not exciting to most engineers. So Uber approached us, they were actually one of the first clients, and they asked us like, uh, how can we, how can you help us deliver to the engineering community that we work on great and interesting challenges? Uh, and here is kind of the result of, nowadays a lot of companies have this, but this was, an evolution of that idea. Well, what if you could let people solve challenges about your company on code fights? Because all of those engineers can now go and see, well, let me try to be an Uber engineer for an hour and solve a challenge that's about Uber, right? So this specific challenge is something like uh, finding the closest location of the ride so that you can build it into the Uber's app. So this way, as an engineer, before I go ahead and respond back to you, I can actually solve this and say, that was cool. I wonder if there's more t challenges like this that, it, that they work on and reach back out to you. And with that, we go into the Q&A. All right, so let's go ahead and open up some additional questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them into your questions panel and we'll get those moderated out to uh, Tigran. So we do have a couple of coming in, a couple of them coming in. So let's. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple here, and then we will uh, start gathering them up. Uh, Tigran, this one's going to go to that last section uh, that you were on around branding. Uh, some of these are similar, so I'm going to kind of round them up. Can a cool. recruiter really affect branding of their company? It's a great question. Uh, I do think you can if for nothing else than by at least bringing attention to it, right? So like a lot of the times, uh, lack of branding comes from lack of awareness of where do people go when they're doing research about you? So by bringing it up either to your manager or your manager's manager and saying like, hey, we're sending all these reach outs, we're not getting enough responses back, I have a theory that it's because of this, uh, then they can go ahead and take action. Like hands-on, it's hard to create great candidate branding, but if you leave it just to your, you know, leadership team, most of the time they will be focused on just kind of overall branding, not recruiter branding, right? Like recruiting branding is its own world. Overall company branding is its own thing. So you do want them to be thinking about places where your candidates go and making sure you've got great presence there. Okay, good. So we have, we have a, a few more, but before. I get to that i do want to read a comment or at least summarize a comment uh that one of the that one of the attendees have today they wanted us to just make sure that we let people know that these are just tools uh and not to rely on them to do all of their work it's really about relationships and the human human touch um lee completely completely agree with that these are just tools part of the tool belt or the strategy um this is a this is a humanized job there's no doubt about it um, yeah, and I completely yeah. agree with it. I mean, at the end of the day, honestly, kind of this is part of our goal as a company to uh, take the work that's not about building relationships and recruiting people and explaining to them how awesome your company is, uh, taking all the other distractions away so you can focus on that. And that's never going away. It doesn't matter how advanced AI and the tools get, recruiting is always going to be about humans. Yeah, so Kurt, you're good. 
Uh, Kurt just responded back to uh, Lee's quest or Lee's comment here. Tools, I thought AI was replacing me this year. Uh, you're you're good for another year, Kurt. So <laughs> no, no worries there. Um, okay, another question is, what strategies do you suggest to get better reviews on Glassdoor? Better reviews on Glassdoor. Uh, that's a great question as well. The strategy that I've seen work for several companies is essentially a dry run strategy. What a dry run strategy is, is, well, first of all, to get better reviews, well, to get reviews at all, you usually need to go ask your employee, uh, your employees to actually write reviews. Now, you don't want to do it blindly and then find out people are unhappy. <laughs> the better way to go is to find some sort of a tool. It can be as simple as Google surveys, but there are more complex tools out there that do this that essentially let you run company-wide surveys and find out what do people think about uh, you know, the company and are they happy or unhappy. If they're unhappy, you can find ways to fix that and run the survey again. When you know you're getting great results and people are happy working where they're working, then you can go ahead and ask them to go to write reviews on Glassdoor, in which case you're pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna get great reviews. Now, this is reviews from employees. There is also, Glassdoor also has reviews from candidates, which you have a lot more control over. Uh, the best way that I've found to get great reviews from interviews is to ask most of your candidates to actually write reviews. Because unfortunately, what happens is without prompting, only the ones who hated it go and write reviews, right? So like the ones who really love it don't actually take the time to go write a review, but the ones for one reason or another hate it go write a review. So companies who don't pay attention to this usually get very poor Glassdoor reviews on interviews, but the ones who ask their candidates, like pretty much every single one, right? Like I'm assuming if you're doing your job well, you've got on average pretty good experience for candidates. Uh, a few will always be unhappy because that's how things are, but overall you will get a great uh, statistic if you ask most of them to post a review about you after their interview. So let's, Let's just, we can wrap up on Glassdoor at this question here, but how do you handle a negative review on Glassdoor? And you kind of touched on that, but let's just say you're getting a handful of negative reviews. How do you recommend handling that? Uh, honestly, I don't, you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that, but I, my suggestion, I don't know if this is an accessible feature or not. I mean, Glassdoor is really expensive. I honestly, they've asked us a million times. We've never paid for it. I don't think you need to pay for it, but this might be actually a paid feature. But normally, if it's accessible, like writing a response, a polite response is usually good. Like if it's a, from an employee saying like, thank you for the feedback, we'll work hard on that to make sure it's addressed. Uh, from, if it's from a candidate, similar response, right? The worst thing you can do is start arguing with them. I've seen this countless times where even CEOs would go in and start bashing the reviewer in terms of you're a liar, that's not true, that's like terrible. <laughs> Never yeah, we, we've, all seen, we've all seen examples of that for sure. Um, so we got a couple questions around the, the slides you were using, the LinkedIn sales navigator. Yeah, Kurt, like the coffee shop in Oakland. That was the, the Primo case, I remember that one. Um, around the LinkedIn uh, sales navigator. So first question there is, how did Tigran get the 34 emails into the LinkedIn screen that he used to hover over addresses? Uh, can you go back to that slide? Back, back, back. I'm assuming we're talking about this, right? Yeah, how did yeah. you get the email addresses in there? So essentially, if you go back two more, I think that one more, one more. You go back one more, one more. <laughs> there you go. So when you click permutate, right? When these permutations are generated, there's like a copy to clipboard. So once you create permutations, the second screen shows up, which is 34 emails, and then you click to copy. When you click to copy and then create a basically inside Gmail, that wasn't the LinkedIn screen. I think that's where the confusion is coming from. If you oh, go yeah. back to that screen, that's essentially Gmail, right? Because you've got the Chrome extension installed, uh, that Chrome extension works inside your Gmail. So when you create a new window where you are typing an email and in the to field, you 
just paste all of the 34 emails. Well, as you start hovering over on the sidebar inside your Gmail, uh, the basically the sales navigator will start generating profiles that they exist. Right. Okay. So, so the confusion there, guys, was you're not pasting that into Sales Navigator. You're you're dropping that directly into a Gmail uh, to the in, in the address bar there. Yeah. So, like in the creation window, Gmail. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That, that was a small screenshot. That's why it sort of doesn't show the rest of Gmail. That's why the confusion yeah. felt like it in LinkedIn. Okay, and we have a couple more on the branding, but before we get there, we do have one on Chrome extensions. What is the latest, greatest Chrome extension uh, that you would recommend to play with? Latest, greatest Chrome extension, I guess, as it relates to recruiting. Well, Sales Navigator is old news. Uh, this is going to sound a little promotional, but Codevice did recently launch a Chrome extension. Uh, this is the only one that comes to mind, I'm sorry. But we did launch a Chrome extension that what essentially it does is it uh, scans keywords on somebody's LinkedIn profile and tries to match it to your job so you basically can save time. right? So like instead of you reading the whole profile and trying to catch keywords, it does the scan for you and it tells you at the top like there is an X percentage match for you. Okay. And what they, they, can they just go to the Chrome store and find that? Uh, actually, you have to request a demo for it. I'm sorry, because there is oh, that there is a setup involved. You have to go to codefacecom slash recruiter and request a demo for someone to show it to you. Right. Okay. And so let's do one more here uh, about emails. This one's about emails. What do you suggest I do when we have their personal email and they are still not responding? Uh, that's a good question. There is a few things you can do. So if the, you do the follow-ups and everything, they're not responding. You can always and should always connect with them on LinkedIn and make sure you use the notes section. Don't say in the blind LinkedIn connect because they won't remember who you are. You use the notes section, which is something like 400 characters to tell them like, hey, I sent you a message on email. Don't sound accusatory. That's bad. You don't want to accuse them. You always want to give them a way out, which is like, if emails get lost in inboxes all the time, so just wanted to send a LinkedIn connect as well to see if you have time to chat and with the closing question. Uh, other than that, you can also follow them on social media and kind of sort of let them know that you're still excited about talking to them. But don't pressure too much. You also don't want to be, you know, appear too overwhelming. Right. Okay, so we have two two more questions we can wrap up with, and cool. if we missed your question or your question comes in after we end, uh, we will be able to help get those answered. Um, so let's go with the last two, and then we'll wrap up for today. We do not have this. This one goes to the branding, uh, the email templates. We do not have restrictions or templates that we need to use on our reach outs. What are some ways that you recommend that I can that I can be a real person? Let me just hang on one second. That I can be a real person when I'm emailing candidates that have not already applied to my openings. Wait. So what was the beginning of it? Did it say we don't it, have restrictions? Yeah, they don't have any restrictions and they don't have any templates that their company uh, has approved for them to use. So it sounds like they're on their own. Uh, I to see. do whatever they do. So they're looking for some recommendations. They can sound like a real person for people right. that have not applied uh, for their job. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a good question. I mean, it's that's really hard to do. But my suggestion is like to try to write a template as if you're emailing your friend. I know it's hard to do, like, but when you put your hat on and imagine you're sending an email message to a friend, you can actually try, right? So like, try sending an email to a friend just like for fun. Try to recruit your friend. How do you type that message versus how do you type a message to a candidate? I feel like a lot of the time recruiters just get their sales hat on and sound super salesy when they're writing a message to a candidate, uh, which comes across, right? If you want to sound like a real person, uh, certain things there that you would do when messaging to a friend, everything from a smiley to kind of more conversational language instead of very formal helps come across as a human emailing instead of just a template. Right, good. All right, last question before we wrap up. What are your thoughts on video-based emails? Should we send them direct to YouTube or some sort of a landing page on our 
company site. Video based, what was the word there? Video based what? Emails. Video based emails. Should we send them to, uh, yeah, so I guess. I guess what they're asking is if they're including a video in their email. Oh, I got it. Send them right to YouTube or do they send them to their company oh, site on a planning mm -hmm. page or some sort? My recommendation, the strong recommendation would be, especially if you're on Google Apps and you're, well, even if you're not on Google Apps, if you're basically sending anything that's already on YouTube, it's a strong recommendation to use a link straight to YouTube. Here's why. What Gmail would do, and most people do use Gmail or Google Apps, is it would convert your link to actual preview at the bottom of the email. So if you're sending a YouTube link, all they would have to do is just one click, and they, it, the video would pretty much either start auto-playing, or you might have to click again, play straight in, inside Gmail to watch that YouTube video which means that the chances of that person watching the video are exponentially higher than if you're sending them to a landing page. Because if you're sending them to a landing page, I pretty much know from looking at that link, I'm gonna click on the link, I'm gonna go have to find a video, and then I'm gonna click again, and what's the point? I mean, you're really trying to get them to watch a cool video about you. The fewer clicks and the higher likelihood of them watching it, the better for you. And the preview really makes it more appealing to click and watch it because it already shows you a glimpse of what the video is. Yeah. Yep. All right. Lex, I think we are good. We are out of questions. And uh, I'll pass it back over to you. Awesome. Well, that was awesome, you guys. We almost pulled the hour. Um, which is always great. Thank you, everybody, for all of the great questions that you asked. And as Ryan had said earlier, if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure we pass them along to Tigran and he can reach out to you personally. So don't worry, you will not be ignored. We'll make sure to get your questions answered. Um, and just stay tuned. Within the next 24 hours, we'll make sure we send out a copy of today's recording and presentation so you can get your hands on it. So just be patient so we can make everything look pretty on our end, and then we'll get that sent out. Um, make sure you head over to recruitingwebinars.com and check out our past webinars as well as the upcoming webinars. We have a lot going on in the next few weeks, so make sure you check that out. Um, and thanks again for joining us today. You know how to get in touch with us, and if there's anything you need, my email information is in that GoToWebinar page. So thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.